What a joy it is for me today to be at Goad International in Piqua, Ohio. This is a day I really look forward to. The Goad family is a very close family to me and to my wife, Margaret, and to our kids. Uh, I've known them for a few years now, and I know of nobody that has a greater passion for the Lord. I know of nobody that has greater dreams that they want to accomplish for the kingdom of God. I know nobody that has a heart for people more than the goads. And to be in the uh, sound studio today with their entire organization, not only people that are in Piqua, Ohio, but uh, part of the organization, of course, is spread out all over the United States because they do a tremendous ministry in uh, urban community. They have a tremendous impact on kids. I think last year ministered to over 70,000 kids in the urban community. They're in 11 cities across America. In fact, as I take a moment uh, to all of our Enjoy Life listeners and, and talk to you about this ministry, there are many of you that you really want to kind of take note of what I'm saying because there are many churches that you really want to make a difference in your urban community, but you're not sure how to do it. Well, if you would just call the GOAT International people, uh, they would uh, perhaps be able to partner with you. This would be a lot of fun. Uh, touch your community. These kids are loaded with talent. Um, one family. Uh, I, I've never seen so much talent and beauty in one family in all my life. Just love of the Lord. They, they uh, incredible musically. I just, uh, before I came in to talk to you today, I was in the other sound studio, and I listened to a new CD that's coming out very quickly. And um, I listened to about five of the songs, and I mean, you went from uh, ballads to rock and roll, hang on, fasten your seatbelt, Jesus is coming stuff. I mean... <laughs> One, one, one moment I'm intimate with God, and next moment I'm looking up to see if he's coming down. You know, like, uh, just unbelievable. The talent. In fact, uh, I, I, because of my vital interest in their ministry, my wife Margaret's a board member on Goat International, because I love these kids so much, um, I, I have put their uh, phone outline. And uh, the reason I do that is because pastors, many of you are going to want to talk to them about their urban ministry. Many of you are, are going to maybe perhaps want to get them in for a concert. They do concerts and convention centers and, and both in the business and the Christian world. Um, I, I just you, You're just going to want to talk to these kids. You're going to want to find out how you can partner together for ministry. They not only uh, are in the urban communities with these centers that they have, but, but they're also worldwide. I mean, they, these kids are putting uh, medicines and, and, and food in the hands and the mouths of, of tens of thousands of people around the world. And this is exciting. I think last year, uh, one of the goats told me that you put five million Bibles in the hands of people. I mean, th listen to me, Enjoy Life Club listener. This is a family that has a heart to reach out to the world. If this family humanly could do it, they would touch every life. They would not life unchanged. And for me to be here in Pickwell, Ohio, uh, with the goads and, and with you in this organization, and to tell you, first of all, I love you. Secondly, that I believe incredibly in what you're doing. And thirdly, that I just love partnering with you myself. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for the impact you've had on my life. And uh, thanks for letting me come here today to be with you. For today, this lesson I want to talk to you about is entitled, If I Could Do It All Over Again. Whoa. Let, let me tell In the studio something probably rather stupid okay okay let me let me just kind of really pinpoint it down here for you after you've done you know something that was just maybe a little bit miserable how many of you thought oh i wish i could go back and do that over again let's take a a, a, a poll here huh? every one of you some of you are raising two hands some of you <laughs> some of you are raising your feet at the same time say like, oh yes if i could do it all over again every one of us have said that to ourselves oh if i could just go back and do it all over again. This lesson, uh, a kind of a subtitle, is, is Lessons I've Learned from Mistakes That I've Made. And uh, this is going to help you. First of all, I want to say that I've made a lot of mistakes. And so what I'm going to do is talk to you about the mistakes I've made. And, and you're going to find out very quickly that it's my spiritual gift. You're, going to, <laughs> you're just going to find that I major in failure. I mean, you've never seen anybody so happy and so, so bad in your life. I mean, it's amazing. And you're just going to find out real quickly that I have looked at mistakes differently than most people have looked at mistakes. Um, about seven or eight years ago, 
I think it was out of either Leadership Magazine or Christianity Today. I'm not sure which. Uh, I read this piece, and I want to start the lesson off with, with this piece, okay? So just kind of listen, and this will kind of set the tone for the whole lesson. My counselor has finally forced me to face the fact that I'm a failure in my ministry. Permit me to list my evangelical demerits. First of all, I've never been to the Holy Land. I mean, not even as a visitor, let alone as a tour guide. <laughs> I wince whenever I see one of those go to the Holy Land brochures. And my wife has even stopped buying kosher wieners because they make me feel convicted. It, uh, it's terrible. And then it goes on and says, every program I've ever started in the church has failed. Uh, our evangelism explosion didn't explode. <laughs> it gave an embarrassing pop, rolled over, and died. <laughs> He said, I attended a church growth seminar, and while I was gone, six families left the church. <laughs> no explanation. They just disappeared. He said, the refugee family that we tried to sponsor refused to come. <laughs> he, said, he said, the last I heard, they were seeking asylum in a Chinese restaurant in St. Louis. <laughs> He said, he said, whenever I try dial a prayer, I get a wrong number. <laughs> it's usually a funeral home <laughs> or a chicken carryout place. He said, I tried dial a meditation the other day, and the tape broke after the first sentence, which was, so things aren't going well today. <laughs> he said, then let's talk about board meetings. He said, uh, you should attend them because no one else does. He said, I get the wildest excuses from my board members, such as the dog was sick, or I had to change the light bulb in the garage, or my wife needs both cars. <laughs> <laughs> then he goes on, he says, our church teams never win any games. Baseball, basketball, volleyball, shuffleboard, you name it, we've lost it. The town Little League champs challenged us and won. <laughs> he said, I'm thinking about sharing all of this with our denominational leaders but they're never around when I phone. <laughs> and all their letters to me are addressed to occupant. <laughs> Said, I've been told that failure could be the back door to success, but the door seems to be locked. And I can't find any key, any suggestions. <laughs> well, this guy describes what all of us have, have gone through in our life. Isn't that true? We've all been there and done that. And I have four goals for this lesson. They're all in your notes. Are you ready? Let's go. Goal number one. For you to learn from my mistakes. And, and the reason this, this is a goal is, I, I love this statement, a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. Nobody lives long enough to make them all himself. Uh, isn't that true? So, so we kind of learn from one another. The second goal of the lesson is to help you admit your own mistakes. Now, I think this is really key. I'm around a lot of people that when you hear them, you would almost think that they never make a mistake. Because they never admit it. And, and we're going to laugh a lot at ourselves. You're going to laugh a lot at me. Because I'm going to talk to you about the mistakes I've made in my life. And you're going to find out that I've learned to laugh at my mistakes. I might as well. Everyone else is. <laughs> and, and we need to just know how to admit our mistakes. Um, you, you'll probably relate to this. One day I was uh, watching a, a, a TV program with my wife, Margaret. And Julia Child, the, I don't know, the kind of the everybody's America chef, you know what I mean, was doing a TV thing on, on, on and she was, she, she was saying, today we're going to make a souffle. Now, now this, this really captured my imagination because she said, um, uh, we're going to make a souffle, and she starts beating stuff and whisking stuff, and, 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 and while she's doing it, she kind of just works herself up in a frenzy. I don't know if you've ever watched her do this, and, and, and starts to sweat, you know, the lights of the camera, no doubt, and she takes her apron, and she's wiping the sweat off her face, and she's talking, and she throws it in the oven, and then she talks some more, and, and then she finally pulls out this souffle, and it's as flat as a pancake. And she just laughs, and she said, oh, my, it's as flat as a pancake. Well, she said, you can't win, win them all, bon appetit, and off she went. And I looked at this lady, and I thought, this is the way to live life. You know all Julia Child was saying was? Didn't work out. So what? Eat it anyway. <laughs> Enjoy life. Don't get so carried away with who you are and what you think you can do to somehow think that you've got to Act as if you're never going to mess up in life. So this lesson is to help you and help me to admit our mistakes and, and have the same kind of a spirit that Julia Child has. And, and thirdly, it, it's to help us learn from our mistakes. The single most important difference between those who achieve and those who don't 
is their ability to learn from their mistakes. Incredible. And finally, number four, to help you quit making the biggest mistake of all, of all the mistakes you can make, here's the biggest one. Are you ready? Fear of making a mistake. The moment that you and I fear that we're going to make a mistake, then I promise you, we've made the biggest mistake of all. Kyle wrote, uh, has a tremendous quote in the notes, it's all in your notes. He said, there is no doubt in my mind that there are many ways to be a winner, but there's really only one way to be a loser, and that is to fail and not look beyond your failure. Again, Kyle says it's not the failure, it's not the mistake that's the problem. It's the failure to learn from the failure. Now, this isn't in your uh, notes, but let me just read you one more thing. Just listen carefully. Too many people are having what we call near-life experiences. Huh? They go through life bunting, so afraid of failure that they never try to win the big prize never knowing the thrill of hitting a home run or even taking a swing at the ball. They just go to the plate and bunt, hoping they can get to first base, afraid that if they swing hard, they'll miss the ball and strike out. And then what will people think? Well, in this lesson, as I kind of thought, how can I really help uh, not only you in this studio, but how can I help our thousands and thousands of Enjoy Life Club listeners really deal with this issue of mistakes. I mean, how can I help you? I, I came to a conclusion. I, I, this is one of these lessons I, I you know, I, I didn't have to do research on it. All I had to do is go inside my own life. And I came to a conclusion that one of the greatest ways I can help you handle failure and mistakes in life is to tell you about all the mistakes that I've made. Now, first of all, this was a process. Let me explain this process. I one day sat down with my legal pad and I started writing down all the mistakes I've made. And then all of a sudden I realized this is to be a tape, not a series. <laughs> I mean, after six pages, you understand? I mean, this could be as the world turns. <laughs> I mean, we have got us a potential series here. And I thought, I can't do a series on mistakes. I mean, after you hear a few of them, you just conclude that Maxwell makes a lot of mistakes. And, and you know what I mean? You can't say, please, no more, no more. You've told us enough of all the dumb things you've done in life. And so I said, okay, what I did is I took these, you know, half a dozen pages full of all the dumb things I've done in life. And I said, okay, of all the mistakes I have made, all the stupid stuff I've done, of all of them, which is the greatest? And I came up with 10 of them. And um, I've got a little mixed conflict with this because as I was going over this lesson this morning before I came at the hotel, before I came over here to do this lesson with you, I thought of two or three others <laughs> that certainly belong in this lesson. <laughs> And, you know, and so I'm, the greatest mistake I'm afraid of making in doing this lesson is I'm leaving out some mistakes. <laughs> but I'm going to give it my best shot, okay? I'm giving it my best shot. This is, this is kind of like my top ten list. But now after consideration, it would be some of the top ten, plus a few others that I won't have time to talk about because this is going to be a one tape and it isn't going to be a series. So here we go. Mistakes that I've made, lessons I've learned. The Ecclesiastes writer said, in the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider. You know what he's saying there? When you're having adversity, when you're making mistakes, when you're going through difficult times, when you're failing, he said, consider, think, learn what you're doing. Learn from what you have done. And as I consider my mistakes, um, a couple things. One, I didn't make enough of them. I wanted to be perfect. In other words, you say, John, one of the greatest mistakes you made, one of the greatest mistakes I made is I haven't made enough of them. There have been many times that I didn't swing the bat. I bunted. If I'd have swung the bat, I could have had potential to hit the ball, but I bunted. So one of the mistakes I made is I didn't make enough of them. And the second thing I want you to know is I didn't admit enough of them because I not only wanted to be perfect, I wanted to look perfect. And I want to tell you something, the damaging part of this mistake area of our life is the trying to look perfect. So many times we won't do something, quote, in front of others because we've just got to come off 
looking perfect. Okay, so here we go. Mistakes, mistake number one. And as I go through, you can say a couple things in this lesson. One, you can say is he truly is a dumb man. He really is. And secondly, you can you can kind of categorize how how many mistakes I've made and, and which one maybe is number one. Now, this, this I'm not giving these to you in like mistake number one is my biggest mistake, okay? Uh, I kind of wanted to build up to that. You understand? No, I, they're not building up. These are just the ones that I have done in order. Probably more, th these are mistakes I made probably chronologically in my life more than anything else. Mistake number one, I tried to please everybody. The, let me give you a formula for failure right now. It, it's just what I really said, but I'm going to now have you write it in the notes. If you really want a formula for failure, try to please everybody. Now, let, let, let me get into a little bit of my own background here for a moment for this. Although this may not seem like a huge mistake to you, you have to understand. With my background, um, living in a home without conflict, I had, there was no conflict in our home. I'm sorry. I... Uh, in a society that's highly dysfunctional, you probably won't relate, but I had a good home background, and please forgive me for that error. <laughs> didn't choose my parents anyway, but happened to have two good ones. I didn't have conflict, okay? So you've got to understand, when I go in my first church, I'm not used to conflict. Not only am I not used to conflict, I don't want it. So therefore, I want to make everybody happy. I want to make everybody like me. I want to please everybody. So I'm not leading the church. I'm doing surveys. I'm doing therapy. I'm Mr. Counselor. I'm trying to make sure it all feels right and good. And is everybody happy? And what do you think? Can we get a unanimous vote on this? Huge mistake. Now, I grew up in a, in a, in a church culture that the pastors in the denomination I grew up the, the highlight of the of pastoring a church wasn't growing the church. The highlight of the pastoring the church was the, a unanimous vote. And so they come to the council and say, yes, I had a unanimous vote. And, oh, it's, oh, there's a great pastor. We didn't realize that the guy who gets a unanimous vote is doing nothing. And so I remember my first vote, and I've told the story, so I don't need to go into it long, but I remember my first vote was 31 yes, one no, and one abstained. And, I mean, I called my dad on the phone. I'm in, I'm, I'm in Indiana, and I called dad back in Ohio, and I said, dad, do you think I ought to stay? And I told him what the vote was. He laughed. He said, stay. He said, John, it's the best vote you're ever going to get in your life. But for the next six months, you know what I tried to do? I tried to figure out who that no vote was. I mean, every Sunday I get up and I say, okay, where are they? Where are they? You know what I'm saying? Well, I didn't know till years later that the no vote was from my wife, Margaret. But that's another story. <laughs> That's another story. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. She's never really admitted that it was a no vote. Okay. Now, I never did find out who the no vote was, but, but I, it's a huge mistake. I tried to please everybody. Now, what are the results of mistake number one in my life? Number one, I feared people more than God. So in my life, I am, my, my greatest goal at the end of the day, did I please people, not did I please God? Now, that's terrible to say, but that I'm, this is just me. I'm telling you my mistakes. Number two, I created a codependency in my congregation. I, I created a bunch of sickos. I was codependent on them, and they were codependent on me, and, and we were looking at each other trying to make sure that we were pleasing each other, and, and you know, you're just going nowhere. You're just, the train can't leave the depot. You just got to hold hands and sing Kumbaya and do therapy one more time. <laughs> Number three, I failed to prioritize correctly. I didn't, I didn't prioritize correctly because I wanted to please everybody. So my priorities were not what a leader would prioritize. They were priorities based on what did the people want. So I was living not off of the God agenda or not off of a leadership agenda. You know what I was living off of? I was living off the people's agenda. Because all I'm doing is taking surveys and polls because I want everybody to like me. And number four, I made palatable decisions, not right decisions. I made that would be accepted by the whole group, not decisions that were best. And I want to tell you something. If you make the mistake that I made on trying to please everybody, I promise you, I promise you, 
that you will never make the best decision in your life. Some of the best decisions I've made in my life, and I want to stop here just long enough to, to talk to you at, at Go International and our Enjoy Life Club listeners that are listening to this tape all over America. Some of the most important decisions I've ever had to make in my life, I had to make all alone. I will almost guarantee you in life, if you wait on everybody getting on board, you won't make the best decisions. What the decisions you'll make are the decisions that have the lowest common denominator of threshold of pain in the lives of people. So, what was the lesson learned? Here it is. Remember, the mistake doesn't do you any good unless you've learned the lesson. Always remember that. I'm not glorifying mistakes in this lesson. What I am saying is you will make mistakes. The question is not are you going to make mistakes. The question is will you learn from those mistakes. So what was the lesson I learned? Very simple. I can't lead people if I need people. Powerful lesson. I have learned. Now watch. This is a fine line. I'm ready to go to mistake number two. There's a fine line. So catch me, catch me if you can. I have learned to unconditionally love people and at the same time not need them. If you could ever come to a place emotionally in your life to do that, you will have accomplished much. What I mean by that is I unconditionally love the people that I minister to and serve. But at the same size, I understand, I understand that the moment that I have to have all of their approval for everything that's going to ever be said or done, that's the moment I'll never reach the potential that God has given to me. Because well-meaning people will hold you back. Not because they want to hold you back, but because you're going to take perhaps a trip that they're not going to take with you. So you love them unconditionally, but you don't need them. Mistake number two. The second mistake that I made is... Um, I played the political game. A politician's first commandment is, thou shalt not commit thyself. And um, this you won't under, you won't relate at all. If, if, if those of you that know me will not relate at all this because I don't have a political bone in my body today. And people look at me and they'll say, John, how can you say what you say? How can you just make tough decisions and move right on? And, and, and how can you do these things? It, it wasn't easy. And, and when I, in the beginning, I was a, I was a political animal. Uh, when I went to my first church, I, I sat down and thought, okay, if I do well here, I'll probably get this next church. And I'm telling you, I got into who you talk to, who you know, uh, what you say in front of them, how you position yourself. I mean, I mean, I was a, I was a mess. I, I got into this thing of, of looking at other churches and what size were they and what size were mine and, and how fast did I grow and how fast were they growing and, oh, I grew faster than them. And, and I mean, I would take the, I would take the, um, uh, the, the the annual church report of my small denomination, and I would spend two or three days. Uh, well, my church was gro my church grew faster than all the rest of them, or mine was number four. And I got into this numbers position: who you know, what you do. I mean, it stinks. It, it stinks to God. It stinks to me now. But but I really played this game. Now, oh, let me show you the foolishness of it. Uh, I, I can tell you the day that I, I all of a sudden I thought, John, you are a stupid man. Well, it's one of the times I thought, John, you were a stupid man. Or the many times that people said, John, you were a stupid man. <laughs> Again, it's a gift. I remember one day I was talking to two of my closest pastor friends. And we were having one of these long lunches. We are just enjoying ourselves. And one of my pastor friends, whose name was Dave, he said, John, he said, I was talking to the district superintendent. And he told me if I keep doing what I'm doing in this church, I could perhaps be the next district superintendent. I said, you're kidding me. He said, what do you mean? Well, I said, he told me the very same thing. And my third buddy said, well, he told me that too. And all of a sudden, I said to myself, John, you're playing a game. You're trying to grow and advance in your organization, not by growing the church, not by winning people to Christ, but you're trying to position yourself in for the next possible opportunity. And it, there, it came... Through a process of six months, and I don't need to get into that, came through a process of six months that I despised this, this, this political game. And now, 
absolutely uh, have no interest in it at all. I'm not into any kind of denominational politics or anything. that stuff. Doesn't matter at all. It you know one of the. It's just great to have freedom. That's what it really is. It's just great to have freedom. Now results of mistake number two. Uh, number one, I, I relied on the approval of others more than God. Kind of reminds you of mistake number one, doesn't it? Number two. I compared myself with others. And number three, I failed to develop my personal convictions and values. In 1970, I, I read a book called Spiritual Leadership by J. Oswald Sanders. And that book was one of the turning points in my life. And I didn't bring the book with me because I didn't want to carry it because uh, I'm going to be in three different cities in three different days. But I, but I made a copy of what I wrote. This is what I wrote in 1970 in the back of, of my book on spiritual leadership that I just read by J. Oswald Sanders. And I said, this book has challenged me in three ways. One, to be God's man. No matter if I'm a pastor of five or 500. See, that's as big as I could think back then. Five, I thought, man, if I ever had a church of 500, whoa. Well, God bless me, and I had that many in my restrooms many times. But anyway. <laughs> Whether I'm a pastor of five or 500, I desire to be in the center of God's will. Number two, I want to develop my potential to the best of my ability and never allow myself to be lazy, indifferent, or noncommittal concerning lost souls and improved methods of winning men to Christ. And then the third thing I wrote, and here's what I want you to keep. I'm, I'm talking about I, when you're political, you, you lack convictions. But when, once you get freed up, look, look, at, look, at, look at this young kid. What was I? I was 23 years old when I was settling these issues. 23 years old. Be a spiritual leader with the likeness of Christ. Too many men are stereotyped leaders. Their whole outlook is warped by their surroundings. I desire to follow the word, fellowship with God, and dare to be different when I have prayed on different concerns. God is my idol, Jesus my pattern, and the word is my direction. I hold strongly to the word and feel all others are either prejudices or personal convictions. I will not, with God's help, be poured into another man's mold or preach what I do not believe. At 23 years of age, I wrote this because I learned the mistake of trying to be political. Now, what's the lesson learned? Well, the lesson learned is already written in your notes. I, I, from that, freedom, boldness, and uniqueness became a part of my ministry. Some of the uniqueness of my ministry today is a result that I'm a free person. I'm not trying to get anybody's job. I'm not running for office for anything. You know, do you know, do you know how free you are when you don't have to have somebody else's job? Do you know how free you are when you know where you're going and what you need to accomplish? And that you can now, now you don't have to you don't have to curse anyone else. You don't have to criticize anyone else. You can bless them too because you want them to go do what God has asked them to fulfill. So you begin to you begin to bless others and release and empower others because you know what you're supposed to do and you're not clamoring trying to pull them down so you can get that job. Mistake number three. The third mistake I made is that I put my ministry before my family. Now, of all the things I want to talk to you about, this one hurts me the very most. And I'll move through this one, I think, rather quickly. Here's a quote in your notes. A successful marriage is one that can go from crisis to crisis with a growth in commitment. That's a great statement. Phil has a great statement. I'm going to tell you why. In marriage, in any relationship, you're going to have crisis. You're going to have issues you've got to deal with. You're going to have problems you've got to, that are right in front of your face. The issue is not problems and crisis in marriage. The issue is your ability to work through them. Now, in our case, in our marriage, let me, give, let me give you the picture. I graduate from college in June. Two weeks later, I'm married to Margaret. Two weeks later, we're in our first church, 250 miles from home. And I'm saying, I am going to grow a church. And I put my focus and passion in growing that church. And about three months later, my wife is, is waving and said, hey, do you remember me? Well, sure, I remember you. What do you, what do you want? What do you want? I've got to get back to church. And it took me a process of about six months to a year in listening to her to realize that I was, I was putting my ministry before my wife. We had some long, hard, difficult discussions. And I had to understand that when I made vows at the altar, I didn't make vows to my ministry. I made vows to my wife. And all of a sudden, I had to prioritize who comes first. And very quickly, I realized that my relationship with God and my relationship with Margaret is more important, listen to me very carefully, than anything else in life. 
it was in those days that I learned, I listened. Um, I got tweaked a lot. Now, our marriage is a very strong marriage. But one of the reasons it's a very strong marriage is in those first few months, in those first couple years, Margaret made sure it was a strong marriage. She made sure that John started prioritizing correctly, and, and she really helped me walk through a process that, 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 that has changed my life. Okay. Results of mistake number three. Number one is I had to listen to Margaret. Number two, I began to reprioritize my life which has been tremendous. And number three, Margaret became and is my best friend. And, and by the way, just a little side deal there. Uh, whenever I feel that there's to be a major change in my ministry, I always tell God the same thing. You don't have to talk to everybody, God. You just have to talk to Margaret. You know, I don't want to make it too hard on God. You understand? I'm saying you don't have to talk, tell the world. You don't have to, but, but, but you've got to talk to my wife. Just two of us. Because I'm not going to make a major move without her blessing on it. And I've learned that. And so that, it was a mistake that I made. And, and, and the lesson learned is I now have a new definition of success. And my definition of success is those closest to me love and respect me the most. The people that love and respect me the very most is my own family. And that's very key. So when I got done with the goads and we went out to dinner and we had a big time, I went back to my uh, hotel and picked up the phone, did what I do every day on the road, talked to her for probably 35 minutes last night. We talked about what she's doing in the yard and we talked about what we're going to do when I get back. And, and, and we, just, we just had the best time. And I keep my list and she keeps her list. And I would not let anything ever interfere with that time that I spend with her. Okay, mistake number four. Mistake number four is I failed to equip people. And I put in your notes, often we do not equip people for ministry, but rather we capture people so that we can have a ministry. Uh, in, in my first church, um, I didn't do any training. I didn't do any equipping. I just uh, captured the people. I thought, you know what I thought the highlight was? I thought the highlight was making people come to church and listen to me. And so I'd get them in this little church, country church building in Hillham, Indiana, and I'd preach the message. And, and I was kind of like Mr. Do-It-All, Mr. Doctor, Mr. Fix-It. I was kind of like super pastor. And I took great pride in all the stuff that I did for the church and all the stuff I did for the people. And I made all the hospital calls and I did all the shut-in calls. In fact, it was my goal to make 1,200 calls a year. And I consistently was number one in my denomination in making calls. I was so proud of that. I mean, every year they'd honor me and say, John Maxwell made more calls than anybody else. And I, you know, I just huff and puff. I didn't have a clue how stupid I was. You know, it's awful to huff and puff in ignorance. You see, I thought that the success of my church was how much I could do. I didn't know the success of my church was how much I could equip people to do. That the question was not how many calls do I make. The question is how many calls can I mobilize people to make? You see, I had a one-man show, and I loved it. You know why I loved it? I loved it because of the ego. I loved it because people said things like, Oh, Pastor, we couldn't do it without you. Oh, Pastor, oh, we'll never make it without you. And I believed all that baloney. Can I tell you something? Pastors, listen to me on the tape. Listen to me. If you're into that and you get ego strokes from people saying, Oh, Pastor, we can't make it without you. Can I tell you something? I got bad news for you. They can make it without you. Just die. Just drop dead and they will continue on. This stuff that I'm indispensable and wow, I can just, you know, I, I, I'm the guy. We're not the guy. I wasn't the guy. So what am I doing? I'm running around there making 1,200 calls a year. And did I equip anybody? No. Did I train anybody? No. Did I teach anybody else how to do anything? No. So what happens? I tell you what happens. The church messes up after I leave. Oh, this is awful. Look at this. Results of mistake number four. Number one, the church declined when I left. Of course it declined when I left. Why did it decline when I left? It declined because I did everything. When the guy that does everything, here's a thought for you. When the guy that does everything leaves, the organization will suffer. It's a brilliant thought for the day. I mean, I, people didn't know what to do when I left. So they just kind of looked at each other, kumbaya, and one by one left, and it's six months after left. The good news is we had high days of 300 in that little community. I mean, this is Hillham, Indiana, 11 houses, two garages, one country store. Come on, this is a little place. We had more people in church than we had in the community. 
That's the good news. The bad news is after I left six months, we went from 300 to 100. I mean, we didn't kind of trickle down. We, we fell down. Why? Because I didn't equip anybody. Terrible. Well, the second result of mistake number four is I felt like a failure. I looked back and I had a good night. I thought I'd build a church. I didn't build a church. The thing just fell back down when I left it. Number three, I determined to find out why the church declined. That was a good thing. I said, okay, why did my church decline? And number four, I became committed to an equipping ministry. In church number two, I began to train people because I said, this is never going to happen to me again. And I began to uh, develop people. I began to disciple people. I began to equip people. I began to take them with me and show them how to share their faith and, and, and how, to, uh, how to deal with, with uh, confrontation and how to visit the shed-ins. And, and I, I started equipping them because I said, this is never going to happen to me again. And the lesson learned is very simple. Overseeing people equals addition. Equipping people equals multiplication. And I learned real quickly. And by the way, I'm so thankful for this because um, um, now that I've left Skyline for almost three years, the church is, the attendance is larger than it's ever been. The baptisms, they're baptizing more people. More people are receiving Christ. Uh, the, 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 the finances are up. Everything, every, here's what I wanted you to know. Everything is better today after I've left that church than when it was when I was there. See, now, now think about it. My first church, everything fell apart when I left because I didn't equip anybody. In my last church, they never missed me because I equipped them. See, I, that's what I'm learning. I'm learning things. I'm learning there's no success without succession, that you have to equip people to get into multiplication. Now, now, by the way, I've given you four mistakes so far, okay? And you're already overwhelmed with all the stupid things I've done, I can tell. All these four, four mistakes I made in my first pastorate, okay? Now, I, I say that to you because most of the time, he, 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 if we do this right, here's what happens. We'll always make mistakes, but we ought to, if we're learning from those mistakes, make more mistakes in the beginning than toward the end. Now, it's not that we won't make state mistakes in the end. I'm still making them. But hopefully I'm making less. That, that's why many pastors, when they go to the first church, they only stay there two or three years because they have made so many mistakes that God can't even help them there. You know what I'm saying, huh? They, they, just, they just need to go somewhere else that doesn't know all the dumb things that we've done. You follow me? That's why I always admire the pastor who goes to his church, and 25 years later he's built this church, and it's a great church, and I think, man, wow, I can't imagine, I guess as many mistakes as I made, you know, I had to leave town at night. You follow me when I left. I mean, you know, Margaret and I load the U-Haul and sneak out of town at 2 o'clock in the morning so that, you know, nobody knows. Okay, okay. But, but most of these, these first four mistakes, most of them I, I, I made, and I will say this, the, the, the mistakes at the beginning, although they may maybe weren't the biggest mistakes that I've ever made, they were the most hurtful mistakes. And when I say hurtful, because I didn't know how to deal with them. I never had anybody teach a lesson like this for me. And so I, when I made mistakes, I, I, you know what I did? I internalized it. I took it really way too personal. I, I got down on myself. I thought, man, John, were you really called? Can you be this stupid and be called? So, so I went through things in my own life, so they were very hurtful to me, only because I didn't have anybody help me through this process. The other day I had a, a young kid just fresh out of seminary. I love, I love the idealism of youth. And he came to me, and he, and he was all excited about his first ministry. I said, well, where, where are you going to go? And, and he said, I'm going to plant a church. I'm going to be a church planner. I said, oh, that is great, because I think it's great to plant a church. And he said, I'm going to plant a church. And then he said to me, because he said, you know what? He said, I've, watched all, I've seen all these other churches, and, and they're filled with mistakes. He said, I want to plant a church right. And I started laughing. I didn't aim to laugh. I didn't aim to, I wasn't ridiculing him. I just started laughing because the statement cracks me up. I want to start a church off right. Can I tell you something? Nobody's good enough to start a church off right. The only difference between the church you plant and the church you inherit is the church you plant will be your mistakes instead of someone else's. <laughs> I love the naiveness of youth. I'm going to plant a church and start it off right. No, you're going to plant a church and mess it up too. It's your spiritual gift just like it is mine. We, we take two steps forward, get a step backward, reconsider, you readjust, take another couple steps forward, take a step backward. That's the way life is. Life isn't a straight upward line without blips in it. 
Okay. That's fun. It's, Pat Robertson said one time, and I love that. It's, this is in your notes. He said, despise not the day of small beginnings because you can make all your mistakes anonymously. <laughs> mistake number five. Here's the fifth mistake I made. I relied too much on myself. This was a huge mistake I made. I'm high energy. I am full of ideas. And I, in the beginning of my ministry, I did way too much of what John can do. And he, here's what I found. There are three levels of effectiveness. What I can do myself, that equals addition. In other words, I, I can go around and I can do everything myself. And, 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 and if I do that, I will get what I call, in my life, Maxwell results. I'll get, I'll, I'll get only what John can do. That's addition. The second level, which is a higher level of effectiveness, is what I can do with others. That's multiplication. That's when I engage others and bring them in on the team. And now, now we're playing team ball. Okay, now that's multiplication. That's much better. But there's even another level that I want to talk to you about briefly, and that is what I can do with myself, with others, and with God. And that's what I call the explosive growth. Now we're getting beyond multiplication. We're getting, we're, now, now, we're doing, now we're seeing and doing things that are beyond anything that we could ever do. This is, the, this is what I call the God factor. This is what I call living beyond your means. Huh? This is what happened in the book of Acts when all of a sudden um, they were doing things that they knew they couldn't pull off. Why? Because they were doing them together, but they were doing them also with God. But in, my, in the beginning of my ministry, I just relied too much on myself. There was a verse of scripture that I didn't understand. It was a passage in John where Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Now, I'm, I'm just confessing sin here, and I'm just sharing my mistake. When I look at that, that verse, without, you, without me, you can do nothing, I'd say, well, I don't understand that. There's a lot of things I'm doing. And I, I, I said, well, you know, I visit these people, and, I, you know, the church is growing, and, 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 and I was full of what I've done. And then one day I realized what Jesus meant was not like, without me, you can do nothing. Like, without me, you can't drive the car. Although some of us need help there. What he was mean is, what he meant was, without me, you could do nothing that has eternal significance. One day in my life, all of a sudden, I realized that I was doing all kinds of things. I really was. I could say, look I, look, I did this, I did that. And then one day I realized it's all wood, hay, and stubble. Yeah, that's good, John. Thank you very much. I build bonfires out of stuff you do. It becomes a wisp of smoke. That's it. See, I didn't realize that. So the results of mistake number five, because I did rely too much on myself, number one is barrenness. I had a very barren ministry in the beginning. I went literally months without anybody finding Christ as personal Savior. And, and, and I went from barrenness to number two, brokenness. Boy, it was a wonderful time in my life when God began to break me. It was a miserable, wonderful time. Six months of it. And number three, breakthrough. And, and I was, when I was going through this lesson this morning, just kind of praying and reviewing before I came here to teach you, I started my public ministry in 1969, so we're, I've been at it almost 30 years now. The greatest year of my ministry was in 1970, and the reason for that is I went through my broken period then, and I'm here to tell you that it was my, you know, it was my worst of years and my best of years. Uh, it was the year that I would never want to go back and touch again with a 10-foot pole the hurt and all the stuff I had to go through. But it was the year that turned me in the right direction. Don't despise the chastisement and the disciplines and the difficulties and the trials and the hurts and the issues. Don't despise them. Uh, be like Joseph who says, you know, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And uh, your worst year can become your best year. And when I'm talking about mistakes to you as an Enjoy Life Club listener, you may be going through some of the most difficult time in your ministry. Right now, you just may be going through a huge, tough time. Don't despise that time. God's molding you. God's preparing you with the right spirit, with the right attitude, with a spirit of submissiveness, God wants to take you through this process and take the mess 
and uh, bring you out successful. Does this make sense? So what was the lesson I learned through this mistake of my life of relying too much on myself? After my brokenness and breakthrough, the words of Jesus, without me you can do nothing, have taken on huge significance. Let me just take one moment to explain that, and then, I, then I'm ready to go to mistake number six. I never anymore, whether it's an Enjoy Life Club lesson I did today or a conference I did yesterday, never when I go to do anything now in the name of Jesus do I ever go in there without first of all saying, God, let me tell you what I know. I know what I can do, and I know what you can do. And there's a huge difference. So I'll tell you what we're going to do, God. I'm going to give you myself, and I'm going to ask you to bail me out one more time. So as I teach, you do what you can do. Let me be a channel. Let me be a river. Flow through me. Because I'm not good enough to give a lesson of eternal impact without your stamp of approval on that lesson. I'm not good enough to make a decision of eternal impact without your Holy Spirit being in the middle of that guidance and in that decision. And I have learned, I have learned through this mistake of depending upon myself that when I do what John Maxwell can do, all I get is John Maxwell results. But when I do what God can do and let him do it, I get God results. There's a lot of difference between God results and John results. Mistake number six. I tried to take everyone with me on my journey. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess to you, of the ten mistakes I'm going to give you, this is my toughest one I still deal with. This, I, I, I still battle this one at times. I've not learned it completely, but I'm learning it. I wrote in there, I think this is a, a Emerson quote, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm not sure. If you travel alone, you can rise up early. If you travel with others, you must wait on them. In my early years, I wanted everybody to take the trip with me. In fact, I, I made some major mistakes here. I thought that all wanted to take the trip. Stupid man, aren't I? I mean, I just, I mean, I've always had high goals and high visions, and to be honest with you, I thought I'm going to the top, and I'd look out and say, Joe wants to go to the top, Susie wants to go, Sally wants to go. I, I thought everybody wanted to take the trip with me. It took me not months. It's taken me years to realize there's a whole bunch of people that don't want to go to the top. There's a whole bunch of people that don't want to take the trip. Now, I want to tell you something. The reason I'm still having problems with this is I still have a hard time accepting the fact that everybody doesn't want to go to the top. But can I tell you something? Read my lips. 99% of the world doesn't want to go to the top. That's why they're at the bottom. I just have to get over in myself the issue that not everybody wants to go to the top. Now, so I thought everybody wanted to take the trip with me. They don't. Then I thought that everybody could take the trip with me. They can't. Now, this is a little harder on me than the first one. The first one I get disgusted with because I don't like people settling for less than their best. So when I see people do that, I, I don't mean this wrong, but I have a spirit within me I have to guard and protect because I write them off. I just look and say, hey, it's your life. Live the way you want to live. Go ahead. But don't look at me and wonder why I got what I got and why you don't got what you got when it's the end. So with the first group of people, I get a little disgusted. But when I got to this issue that I thought that they all wanted or that they all could come, one of the toughest lessons I've learned is they all can't make it to the top. They all don't have the potential. They don't all have the gifts. They don't all have the calling. They don't all have the temperament to make it to the top. That's been tougher for me. That's a tougher one for me. And then I thought that they all should make it to the top. And then I thought it was my responsibility to bring them with me. Margaret said, John, throughout your whole life, and this is one of our, this is one of our lifetime time marriage discussion. She said, I've watched you. You'll find somebody you love and you'll say, here, come on, get on with me. Let's go to the top. And she says, you'll bring them and, and, and they'll say, time out. I don't want to go to the top. And they'll get off the train. She says, you'll get off the train and get them, put them back on the train and say, 
sit there, buckle them up, and you know, tie them up, and off you go. And they get to the next place, and they're untied, and they're getting off the train. You're going out after hour? She said, quit going after the people. Whoa. That's not easy for me. I'm telling you, this is an area, it's still, this is a tough one for me. Um, I remember when I was in my second church, and I was getting ready to make a major change, leave the denomination I was leaving. I was doing everything because I realized I, to go to the next level, I had to leave the area that I lived in. I had to leave the denomination that I grew up in. I had to leave the friends that I'd known all my life to go to the top. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You can do anything you want to in life, but I'm going to tell you something. As a 32-year-old kid, I made the tough decisions. Henry Cloud told me, this wonderful friend, psychiatrist, Henry Cloud t told me, he said, in everybody's life, they come to a place in their life, he called it a train wreck. But he said somewhere in their life, they're going to have a train wreck. He said the earlier they have it, the better they are. He said it's still a wreck. But he said the later you have it, the more stuff you've got on your train. And in my early life, I said to myself, I'm going to have to make some very uncomfortable decisions. And Margaret and I sat down and we waited out. And they were not easy decisions. I had to leave my comfort zone. I had to leave a lot of things to get to where I have to get. I'm very grateful. Steve and I, my son-in-law, we came yesterday from, I had spent the day with my denomination, with the group that I grew up with. And uh, we had a wonderful, interesting family discussion about where I was and where I am and who they are and who I am. And I'm not the same. I love my roots and I thank God for my roots. But that's not who I am. And I see where I am and I see where they are and it's two different worlds. Doesn't make them wrong. Doesn't make me right. Does make us very different. What I'm saying to you is, when I was in my second church, I can remember I had a wonderful assistant. I, I, she, I loved her. She helped me so much. And when I was making this huge change, I had, quote, talked them into moving with me. And I could still remember. I could watch them. I could feel the pressure on them. I could feel the pressure. But I kept saying, but they need to make this move. They need to make this move. I knew they need to make this move. And I can still remember calling one day from Chicago Air Airport to talk to her. And she said, John, i got to tell you something. I said, what? She said, we're not going to go. And I remember I hung up that receiver, and I sat down right in the, if you've been in Chicago Airport there, it's where it's kind of the, it's the round area, right, going to TWA now. But I sat down right by the phone area where I called, sat down there, and the old tears just flew. And I came down my face, and I said, man. They're not going to take the trip. Well, if I've done that once, I've done that a hundred times in my life. Now, the mistake that I make is trying to get everybody to take the trip with me. Um, church planners know this. When you plant a church, can I tell you something? When you plant that church, you get those 30 key people around you. And they're the ones who are going to build this great church. Can I tell you something about those 30 key people that start off with you? Five years later, if you really are successful, there'll be about five with you. You won't take them with you. Most people don't want to take the trip. So what are the results of mistake number six in my life? Number one, I waited on people that I should not have waited on. Number two, I brought people with me that I should not have brought. Oh. And I don't know which is worse. I don't know whether waiting on people that shouldn't have come, or bringing people that shouldn't have come. I guess I, I, I've, I've many times had to stop the train and say, okay, I love you, hop off. And number three, I paid a leadership price in both situations. Again, in all, with integrity in this lesson, I'm still making this mistake. I'm, I'm working on it, I'm trying to do better. Here's, what I'm, here's, here's the lesson I'm learning, okay? God has given me many people uh, as, as on many occasions that have added great value at sections of my journey. He has given me a very few people that will take the entire trip with me. And, and let me tell you something. There's value in those people that are there for the section. Isn't that right? You appreciate that. You appreciate the moment. You appreciate the span of time. You appreciate the, the two years or whatever. You just thank God for them. And then they get off the train and, 
and God then gives you other resources. The other night, I'll tell you when this came to me, uh, just forcefully. The other night I was over at, uh, and some of our Enjoy people, we were over at Andy Stanley's church, and, and we were there was a thing on parenting, and I was participating a little bit in it. And, and so um, when, we, when, when we finished the evening, uh, we went out to a little Mexican restaurant to eat. And, and it was Tim, uh, Tim Elmore and Pam, his wife, and Dan Ryland, his wife, and Miriam, who's been a longtime kind of family friend, and Dick and Debbie Peterson have been with me for 17 years, and my assistant Linda and my wife Margaret, and we're having Mexican dinner. And all of a sudden, I looked around this table, and every one of those people in the past, and most of them 15 years ago, made a commitment to take the trip with me. And I, I, I was flooded with emotion. In fact, the tears started coming. I never even told them what I was thinking. But all of a sudden, I said, they not only decide to take a trip with me, the people at this table will finish the trip with me. And I looked over at Dan and Tim, and they had the same ring I got on my finger. It was a ring that I gave my staff when I was a senior pastor at Skyline after they had spent 10 years with me. This was my 10th year gift to the staff that had spent 10 years with me. And I looked over, and Tim's got his ring, and Dan's got his ring. I looked down at the right of my table, and there's Dick Peterson, who started with me in 1983, and if God gives me another 25, 30 years, he'll be with me clear to the end. And I thought to myself, these are the people that are taking the trip. Now, now let me say one more thing. Listen to me very carefully. The people that take the trip, there's a place in your heart for those people that nothing can ever steal away from. There is a specialness. There is a connection. There is a an understanding that evolves on people that take the trip that is never going to be shared with anybody else. But it's a mistake I've had to work on, okay? Mistake number seven. I didn't fulfill a responsibility as a denominational team member. A team player should always ask what's best for the rest. Now, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this one very long, but this was one that I've I always have regretted. I, I can't do anything about it. But when I was at Faith Memorial Church in Lancaster, Ohio, at, at, because I belonged to a denomination, we were budgeted X amount of dollars. And we were in a multi-million dollar building program. I was a 28-year-old kid, 29-year-old kid, way over my head, way over my head. All my life I've been way over my head. I'm surprised I'm not waterlogged. <laughs> and for two years, because I couldn't make the budget, couldn't quite get the budget, for two years, I didn't pay all of my assessment to my denomination. Now, I'm not here to argue about assessments to denominations. I'm not here. I'm not in, into that game at all. Here, here's what I'm saying is, if I'm part of the team, I ought to pay my freight. And for two years, I didn't. And if there's anything I could do in my pastoral ministry, I would go back and pay off what I should have paid off. I just, and, and I talked, and, and by the way, I talked to the general superintendent, I talked to the leaders, I explained them the situation, they said it's okay, so I mean, but, 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 but in my, it, hey, it might have been okay with them, it might have been okay with everybody else, but I'll tell you who it wasn't okay with, it wasn't okay with me, and the results of that mistake, two things, I let my denominational team down, and number two, I lost my credibility to speak on that issue, that's the day I learned that once you do not fulfill an obligation, you know, never again have the right to talk about that obligation. I hope you caught that one. So you better hang in there. You better do what you say you do. You better put your values where your values need to be because I can tell you, once you lose those values, don't even enter the discussion with me. You're a non-player. Sit over there and sit down. We do not even consider what you have to say. Huge. Lesson learned. Adding value to others is the responsibility of any person or organization that has been blessed. Mistake number eight. Mistake number eight is I allowed loneliness to be a part of my leadership life. In the early years, I did this. The person who said it's lonely at the top wasn't a great leader. You understand that, don't you? Because if they're a great leader, they'd had somebody up there with them. Huh? The only person who says it's lonely at the top is the person who didn't take anybody on the trip. And when you think about it, after a while, they kind of deserve to be lonely. So in my early years, I allowed loneliness to be part of my leadership. And it was, a, you know, there was a, when I was a kid, I was 
faster than the other pastors, and so the, the church grew beyond there, so there were some jealousy factors, and, and I kind of grew beyond the denomination I belonged to originally, and, and uh, the, my own personal growth made my journey lonely. I, I, one, of the things, one of the things I have understood is that if you're going to take the trip, one of the issues I had to wrestle with myself is that there are times that there will be some loneliness in that, in that trip. But here's, here was the problem. I didn't surround myself with prayer partners. I didn't surround myself with people who wanted to help me. I, I took pride in carrying the load when I should have shared the load. The results of mistake number eight, number one was loneliness. Number two was misunderstanding. I had for many, many years this misunderstanding that if I was going to be the leader, that I had to be lonely. And so I walk around and say, well, you know, leadership, the, the loneliness is the price of leadership. And on one day I realized loneliness isn't the price of leadership. Loneliness is the price of stupidity. I just happened to be a leader that was stupid. And then stress more than I needed in my life because I didn't share the load. What's the lesson learned? Very simple. One is too small of a number to produce greatness. So I became committed to team ministry. I became committed to bringing people around me. I said, hey, I got to know what I'm going to do. I'm never going to take, I'm not going to take this trip by myself. Mistake number nine, I assumed my leadership success would allow me to take a leadership shortcut. Wow. What I found is shortcuts don't pay off in the long run. And uh, I've told this story in leadership conferences. I don't know if I ever told the story in a taping. But in 1989, when I was at Skyline, see, I, you can make mistakes recently too. But, but in, in my last, uh, in about my middle, well, I guess it was two-thirds of my way through pastoring the church there in San Diego, uh, in, in, in about a one-month period, I fired a very popular staff member. I made some major changes at the Living Christmas Tree, and I uh, changed the Sunday night service without processing any of it with the, with the board or with the staff. I just made the decision. I was very tired, and I just said, I, these need to be made, and I made them. And, and, and the people didn't understand it because they were used to my style of leadership, which, which is process, which is uh, inclusive. And they said, what are you doing? I said, I just made this decision. And the more questions they asked, the more perturbed I became at them. I got ticked. And this whole process, as I tell in leadership conferences on different occasions, this whole process, I'm, I'm writing a message one Thursday up in my office on Moses, who was getting aggravated at the children of Israel. And I'm loving this message because I'm saying, that's right, a leader should get mad at his people. And I'm, or I'm just saying, I can hardly wait to preach this message. And, you know, I'm saying, amen, Moses, give him hell. I mean, go after him, Moses. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and I'm just writing and enjoying this. And, and I'm even adding some suggestions. Moses, I liked it when the earth swallowed up some of those people. Let's do that one again. That was a great one. You know what I mean? And there have been many times on church, you know, I'd say, uh, could you just swallow up that pew over there? Just swallow those people up. It's my sin, okay? All right. I finished that message. I could hardly wait to preach it until about 10 minutes after I kind of reveled in it and God let me. He said, John, by the way, the message is not for the people. The message is for you. You're the problem, Mr. Author of the book, The Winning Attitude. You don't have one. Read your own book. And I remember in that process, all, and then, then, then God said, but preach it. Preach it the way you want to preach it, hot and heavy. And when you're done preaching it, look at your people and say, by the way, the message isn't for you. It's for me. I'm wrong. I messed up. Whoa. All of a sudden, I didn't want to preach the message. I'm saying, Jesus, if you want to come, well, don't you think today would be a fine day? <laughs> he said, I, I suppose it would, but I'm not sure I'm taking you with me. <laughs> So I'm, saying, so I'm saying, oh, hold on, time out here. Anyway, to make that long story short, the next Sunday I preached the message hot and heavy. When it was done, I said, by the way, it's not for you. It's for me. I'm wrong. I've got a bad attitude. I've been ticked. I'm sorry. Those people wept. They were on their feet. They prayed for me. In five minutes, God did for us what he couldn't have done for us in five years. Because all of a sudden, I just said, I blew it. I made the mistake. I was wrong. Well, the results of mistake number nine, because I did these things, the trust level went down, always will. The anger level went up. The chemistry level went away. 
until I stood before them and apologized. What's the lesson learned? Very simple. Leadership to be respected must be earned daily. There's no such thing as getting to a level of leadership where you're beyond question, where you're on a pedestal, and everybody bows down, calls you Pope, and kisses the ring. Mistake number 10, I made a foolish commitment to Skyline. I love the quote that says, the man who invented the eraser had the human race pretty well sized up. <laughs> eh, I've been there, done that, haven't we, huh? Okay. In, um, in 1986, as we began to embark on a $30 million plus relocation, I was pressured, I knew better than this, but I was pressured by key players and key leaders and key staff to make a 15-year commitment to the church. And the bottom line was that we're going in this huge relocation process, and so there, John, the question we got is, are you going to be with us? If you're going to be with us, we know we can make it. Kind of sounds a little bit like a repeat of church number one. And, 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 and foolishly, I stood before the congregation, and I said, if we go into this relocation process, I'll, I'll make a 15-year commitment to you. Huge mistake. Huge mistake. It was made in the flesh, but it was a mistake. Probably four to five years into that commitment, I realized what I had done. And uh, the results of making that mistake, I'm going to talk to you about how I pulled out of it in a moment, but is number one, it kept me from an openness to God's leading. And number two, I felt guilty when I entertained leaving the church. And number three is I felt trapped. And number four, I needed to deal with this issue when I resigned. When I finally, after, in 1994, 95, when I really began to sense 95, especially that God was saying, John, you've got to, you've got to make this change to the national ministry. You know what I realized? I realized I had to deal with this issue. I had to deal with this issue with the church because I'd made this commitment. So here's how I dealt with it just briefly. I went to the founding pastor, Dr. Butcher. See, I was only the second pastor. He'd been there for 27 years. And I asked his permission to make the change. And I asked his forgiveness. And then I went to the board and asked their permission and asked their forgiveness. I went to the staff and asked their permission and asked their forgiveness. Then I went to the whole church body and ask their permission, and ask their forgiveness. It's the only way I could leave with integrity. Now, the wonderful thing about the sovereignty of God is he had prepared the people. So when I told them I was going to resign, they, they sensed that it was time for me to move on to that national ministry. But I'm here to tell you, I should have never made the mistake of making the commitment to 15 years. The lesson learned is very simple. Make commitments based on God's leading, not the desire of others. Well, what's the conclusion of all this stuff on I've talked to you about mistakes? Thoughts from my many years of making Maxwell mistakes. Number one, don't be afraid of the phrases, I was wrong, I don't know. Don't be afraid of those. Do you know how refreshing it is for the followers to hear their leader say, I was wrong, I don't know. Number two, laugh at yourself. And join the crowd. They're already laughing. Join the crowd. Number three, focus more on learning from the mistake than on the mistake itself. What do we do? We usually focus on the mistake because we say, oh, I look so foolish. I look so, I look so, I sounded so stupid when I did that. And we focus on the mistake and we don't focus on what we need to. Hey, can I tell you something? You did look stupid. You did sound stupid. You are stupid. Now that we've all figured that out, are we going to continue to be stupid? Or are we going to learn from the mistake? Number four, ask for help. If you think you're, all, you're in over your head, you are. Number five, whenever you fall, pick up something. Just... While you're down, just say, well, I'm down here. I might as well pick this up. You know what I'm saying? Just 
Pick it up. Okay. All right. Number six. If at first you don't succeed, you're running about average. Who ever heard of succeeding on the first time? Life isn't that easy. Number seven, if your life is without mistakes, you're not taking enough risk. Don't pride in the fact you've never failed. You've never breathed. Number eight, look at what you have left, not what you have lost. Whoa. Number nine, many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. And number 10, develop a biblical view about mistakes. I think of Peter and his denying of the Lord, and I swear by God, I do not know that man. You know the story. What did Christ do? He restored Peter to fellowship even after his most painful mistake. Paul and Philippians, no, dear friends, I'm still not... All I should be, but I'm focusing on all my energies on this one thing. I'm going to forget the past. I'm going to look forward to what lies ahead. See, following Christ means allowing him to forgive our mistakes and call us to a more glorious future. Now, let me stop this, this lesson by this thought. This morning when I was going over it again, I wrote this down at the bottom of my lesson. It's not in yours, but just listen to it. This lesson has been titled, If I Could Do It All Over Again. Let me say this to you. If I Could Do It All Over Again... I wouldn't do it all over again for two reasons. Number one, I like this part of my journey. Here's what I believe. I believe if you run the race well, even though you mess up in the past, you don't have a desire to go back. You like every station of the journey. I like being 51. I don't want to be 25 again. I like 51. Now, does that mean that at 51 I'm perfect? No. No. But I like each station of my journey. So if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't do it all over again. The second thing I want to say about that is, if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't do it over again because I know I would make as many mistakes the second time as I did the first time. Because life is filled with mistakes. It's not the mistake that's the mistake. It's only when I do not learn from the mistake that I made. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this lesson, for allowing me to maybe just share out of my life mistakes that I've made. I pray that it will be a source of encouragement to men and women who are in the middle of the battle, some winning, some losing. Help them to understand that you unconditionally love us and that as your children, we're to pick ourselves up, learn, regroup, focus on you, and get back in the race. May your grace cover people as they think about this lesson. May healing be given to those who need it. May courage be instilled in those who desperately need to get back up. And may be, this be a lesson that will be a tremendous help to many people as they face the days ahead. I pray in your name. Amen.